All right, y'all, so today I wanna to talk about something that I haven't talked about publicly on my channel before. And no, it's not Palestine, <laughs> already did that. I wanna talk about where I went to school and my experience there and how that's especially relevant in today's political climate and how my time there shaped my views up until this point. So the school that I went to is the University of Pennsylvania. No, not the one with the amazing football team. <laughs> it's the nerdy Ivy League one. Though we do get ranked as the number one party school in like 2013 or 2014 by Playboy. Don't believe me? Look it up. <laughs> But anyways, for those of y'all who don't know, Penn is world famous, especially for its Wharton School of Business, which consistently ranks as the number one business school in the world. Suck it, Harvard. And yeah, we call it Penn. We don't call it UPenn. And it was home to one of the many student encampments that have been happening over the past couple of weeks. So one thing that I remember being really unique about Penn was how large the Jewish population there was, which is great. Penn's a really diverse campus and I'm glad it's a place where Jewish people can feel safe and build community there. I mean, Penn was a very diverse place in general. And so anyways, if we look at these numbers from Penn Hillel, they say that approximately 1,600 students enrolled at Penn are Jewish, which would mean that approximately one out of every six students is Jewish. And to put that into a little bit of perspective, using the numbers that I found online, assuming that like 90 to 95% of the Jewish students are white, because you know, not all Jewish people are white, that would mean somewhere around 40 to 50% of white students at Penn were Jewish. So in other words, almost one out of every other white person at the university was Jewish. And honestly, that was cool for me too, because I'd never been in an environment that was so Jewish friendly. But I mean, you'll seriously hear students calling it the Jew University of Pennsylvania just based on all the diversity there. So yeah, I don't, I don't know how to take that one. And so another thing that I wanna point out is that I'm not saying the school is Zionist by virtue of being very Jewish. I hope that at this point in history, it doesn't have to be said, but it does, that Judaism and Zionism are not the same thing and that many Jews and rabbis are against Zionism and are out there protesting against Zionism today. But what I will say is that the largest Jewish organizations at Penn are heavily Zionist. For example, Penn Hillel, which reaches 85% of the Jewish population, is very Zionist. Like, it's right on their website. <laughs> so given the huge Jewish population at Penn and the strong Zionist organizations that many of these students engage with, you can see how there would be a very strong overlap between the two. So yeah, while I was there, I always felt a very strong Zionist presence. You know, you'd be walking on Locust Walk, which is the main walkway, and there'd be people promoting the birthright trips over the summer. Or, you know, you'd hear about people vacationing in Israel or, you know, people's sexy hookups during these birthright right trips. And the concept of Israel is so normal. You know, you'd always hear it as like the Silicon Valley of the Middle East or the democracy of the Middle East, the crown jewel of the Middle East. It was just so normal to like go there and talk about it. You never really heard any criticism about it. And another thing I'll say about Penn is that it was a school that attracted people from very powerful families. Um, like, I'm not even kidding. Donald Trump was at my graduation and Joe Biden. And so there's another thing that I don't know if it's unique to Penn. Like, let me know if this was the same in y'all's college experiences, at least in the US. But a lot of the most exclusive fraternities or social clubs were the Jewish fraternities. I would say that like the top five most exclusive fraternities, probably half of them were Jewish. It's like, why does that matter? Penn is like this really interesting institution because we're an Ivy League school, but we also like to call ourselves the social Ivy. But at the same time, everyone's really pre-professional. Everyone's vying for that McKinsey internship or that Goldman Sachs full-time offer all the time. And it almost always, at least my experience, was that it almost always felt like a professional and social and academic competition at all times. And a lot of these exclusive fraternities, by virtue of being the most exclusive fraternities, they would run a lot of the social scene. And that's not just the Jewish fraternities. Any of the most exclusive fraternities were the ones that had some of the most desirable parties that people wanted to be a part of. And a lot of these exclusive groups were also pipelines to some of the most lucrative job offers that you could get after graduating from Penn. And Penn is a school that puts so much emphasis on both the social and career side of things. And so if you wanted to get some of these most sought after jobs or be at the most desirable parties, a lot of the times that would mean you would inevitably interact with a lot of Zionists. And so just by virtue of interacting with those circles, there would be a lot of normalization of Israel. And so imagine if you don't really know anything about Israel, then that normalization of Israel is really gonna shape your narrative. I mean, like, let me remind y'all, 10 years ago, it was not popular to talk about Palestine. Like the whole anti-Semitism isn't anti-Zionism thing just became mainstream like in October. Like I'm serious, if you think this topic is sensitive now, 10 years ago, it was even worse. What's interesting too is that I found an article a week ago about a non-Zionist Jew at Penn who was describing her experience at Penn and how she felt very alienated by being a Jew who doesn't support Israel during this time. And let me read a snippet of her article for you. Since October 7, Penn Halal, Chabad, and Mior have continued to host communal events for Jews that necessitate standing with Israel. 
There has been no collective Jewish space for us to mourn and grieve through difficult times that does not inherently alienate those who take a critical stance on the Israeli government's actions. We had let the concept of non-Zionist Jews become so taboo that at a time when all Jews needed to be in community and talking to each other most, there was no space made for non-Zionist Jews at the table. Because of this, the Jewish community was set up to rupture, in my opinion. And she goes on to say that if you're not a Zionist Jew at Penn, you get labeled as a race hater, a race traitor, or self-hating Jew. Like her Jewishness was called into question. So, you know, all that stuff people just love hearing. And then at the beginning of this year, there was a Penn faculty trip to Israel and it was funded by groups like Penn Hillel. And this was the first trip from faculty from an American university since the October 7th attacks. While at the same time, there was huge backlash a couple months before that, a couple weeks before October 7th for the Palestine Rights Literature Festival, which was being held on Penn's campus. Even Penn faculty members have criticized Penn for making statements about the Palestine Festival, but not saying anything about the Penn faculty trip. Anyway, something that was also unique about my experience at Penn was that I studied Arabic there. Yeah, so I'm not Arab, y'all. I'm Mexican. And that was a really cool experience to have at Penn because I remember just sitting in class with you know, I was the only, I feel or one of the only non-Arab adjacent people in the entire program. Like next to me were people who, you know, whose parents were like Egyptian or Syrian or people who were Arabic adjacent, like maybe they were Pakistani students or like, you know, people with Pakistani descent, um, people who are Muslim. I don't fall under any of those categories. So it was interesting to be surrounded by such a different perspective in a group of students that I honestly would have never been with in any other circumstance. And even despite all of that exposure, I was still not pro-Palestine while I was at Penn. Or at least I didn't hold the beliefs that I do today. You know, I just thought it was, oh, it's more nuanced. You know, it's just more complicated than you would think. And so I even studied abroad in Jordan as part of my, you know, program to learn Arabic. And honestly, it might sound paradoxical, but my time in Jordan made the whole topic about Palestine even more confusing for me. Because while I was there, one of my closest friends I didn't notice at the time, but he was this huge Zionist. And at the time, I just saw him as this really well-educated guy. He also studied at another Ivy League university and, uh, and he was Jewish. And I thought, okay, this guy is gonna know what he's talking about because he has both the exposure to it's like Hebrew and the Jewish side, and he's also studying Arabic. And it wasn't until years later where I realized that a lot of the stuff that he was telling me was really Islamophobic, or it was just the recycled Israel, or sorry, Zionist talking points that you keep hearing over and over and over again. But honestly, I, I bought them hook, line, and sinker when I was 20. Today, this guy's IDF. I mean, but that really set my thinking back a long time. But also, I do want to say that at Penn, it's not like everybody was Zionist. You know, I had this one friend who would always send me these memes linking indigenous people to Palestinian people and comparing their struggles. And I remember at the time, I didn't really understand them, so I just sent back. Lol. <laughs> yeah, like I just did not get the connection. And what's funny about that is that he was sleeping with a Zionist, so you know who you are, dude. <laughs> like I said, despite coming out of Penn with all of my exposure to the Arab world and my Arab friends, I was still not crystal clear on Palestine. Though I do remember that a few years later, I was at this skiing weekend with a bunch of people from Penn and we were playing beer pong and we were trying to name the different teams, you know, like shirts and skins or whatever. And one of the guys said, oh, let's do Israel versus Palestine. And everyone started laughing. And even at that moment, I remember being like, all right, y'all, that seems kind of fucked up. Like, that seems in poor taste, y'all. And I didn't truly understand Palestine until I went vegan. Because when I made the connection that nothing justifies what happens to animals, I realized, okay, then nothing justifies what happens to the Palestinians. But today I'm not trying to get y'all to go vegan. That's what my other videos are for. But anyways, once I got Palestine, I felt so guilty that I had spent so many years not understanding it, being around Arab friends, and I just feel like I kind of let them down. I had been letting them down this whole time. And you know, obviously not just them, but the people of Palestine themselves, right? The people who are being oppressed. And so I felt like I had a duty to make up for that lost time. And if you even watch my first YouTube video, well, I don't say it, but I remember when I was making the video, there's one part where I talk about oppressed groups and I want to bring up Palestine, but I was afraid and I didn't say it. So it was one thing before I got it and then it was another thing before I started being open about it and speaking about it on a public platform. But I think one of the most shocking things for me to 
process was seeing the reactions of all of my Penn classmates after October 7th. And like, again, all these people at Penn, very left-leaning university, they were out there marching for BLM, they're out there marching for LGBT, they're out there on Pride, you know what I mean? They're posting those Instagram pictures. The vast majority are aligned with these left-leaning movements. But then October 8th, October 9th, I was seeing people post Israel flags or post in support of Israel. And I was absolutely shocked to see this. Remember, these are people who were 10 years out of Penn. And a lot of people posting these things weren't Jewish. Like I, I do understand Jewish people posting pro-Israel stuff. Like I obviously don't agree with it, but I do understand what would drive them to post that. But a lot of the times the people who weren't Jewish who were posting this stuff were the people who, like I mentioned, had been affiliated with all of these very exclusive groups at Penn. But even then, like me, for example, I have a very left-leaning progressive friend that I always talk to about leftist issues. And like me, he's a person of color and he posted in support of Israel a few days after October 7th. And that just really shocked me. Like, I couldn't believe it. You know, I think we can't deny the overlap between white supremacy and Zionism. And I think what I'm about to say is a unique experience of a person of color growing up in the US. Me, I'm Mexican, and I remember growing up, it was weird because I always wanted to be like the white kids. Like I sort of understood that I was different and I wanted to speak like them. I wanted to wear the same clothes as them. I just feel like I really wanted to be white. You watch these high school movies, for example, and you've got the captain of the football team with the beautiful girl on his arm, and these are always white people, the desirable people, the people that everybody wants to be and admires, the heroes of the stories. And I saw that and I thought, well, I want that for myself too, I, I want that. And I felt like the only way to do that was to try to be as white as possible. And that, that's not something that I was consciously doing. It wasn't until COVID, years, years later, that I realized that I was kind of on autopilot my whole life, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, even college, trying to be accepted by these white communities and become that desirable, hero of my own story. When it comes to Zionism and that overlap with white supremacy, a lot of people of color like me have to decide if I vocally show my support against Israel, then I'm also rejecting all those years of me trying to be white and be accepted by white people. At least that's how I felt about it. I realized it was a fear of being rejected by white people after years of trying to be as white as possible. And that's why I say I can understand maybe my friend who I'm talking about who's a person of color, when it came to the dilemma, he decided, you know what, I don't want to obey in all these years of hard work that I've put in to be accepted by white people. And obviously, this goes without saying, not all white people are like that, I am generalizing. I'm speaking mostly of the overlap of white exclusive groups and Zionism. But yeah, after October 7th, it was just shocking to see how much of a stranglehold Zionism had on all of these people that I knew and how these circles that were formed at Penn all these years later still have such an influence on people who are otherwise very open-minded and left-wing. And to this day, most of my peers haven't said a thing. You know, honestly, I don't think there's been a single person from my fraternity who said anything. The only Penn students I can think of who post stuff about Palestine who aren't Arab are minority students, pre like people of color. And I still think it's very brave of them because lots of them have been faced with backlash. You know, they get accused of anti-Semitism by these same pen people. Like I've had multiple pen friends of mine send me screenshots of the harassment and garbage that they receive from pen Zionists. Literally y'all, someone who I don't even, like we don't follow each other, he went out of his way to go on my profile and reply to one of my stories and say, this is problematic, bro. Y'all, it was one of the posts explaining how Iran threatening Israel was not unprovoked because Israel had already been being aggressive towards Iran. Anyways, and I actually do have some pen friends that I keep in touch with. They feel like they have to keep quiet so that they can maintain their social circles or that they don't lose out on career prospects. And like I was talking about earlier, I was so afraid to post publicly at all as well. And a big reason too is because I've spent so much time and money trying to grow this YouTube channel and I didn't want to post something that I felt could tank my channel. But then at one point I just thought, man, honestly, I just, I just have to do it. And yeah, now I post about it publicly all the time. So I'm probably not gonna have any more college friends after this video, so please subscribe. <laughs> so I'm not Palestinian, but I do want to share with y'all a Palestinian voice from Penn. So this is an excerpt from an article that a Palestinian student wrote about their experiences at Penn. So he wrote this article actually in response to the Penn faculty trip to Israel. He remembers that he had a conversation with one of the people in that photo who's a prominent member of the Penn community when he was a freshman at Penn. And respectfully, he doesn't name the person, but he wanted his story to be heard and added to all the different stories that exist about what can happen and does happen on Penn's campus. So he talks about how in his freshman year, he was walking on Locust Walk, which is the main walkway I was telling you all about, and he sees a table that's commemorating a Jewish holiday. So he was interested, he goes up, he starts talking to the people there, 
And then he starts having a conversation with this person from the photo op. And so the conversation is going really well. It's all cordial until, well, let's read. The person then asked me where I was from. I told him that I'm an American immigrant, a Palestinian Christian born in Jordan who came to the US at a young age. You're not from Palestine. You mean you're from Jordan, they retorted. Brushing aside this remark as a simple misunderstanding, I corrected them that, though I was born in Jordan, I am not just Jordanian. I identify by blood and indeed by spirit as a Palestinian, and my family comes from Palestine. No, they stated curtly, Palestine does not exist. I had felt hate on our campus. This person no longer sought to deepen our nascent connection, but instead to deny my identity outright. Their spiteful words lodged themselves like a boastful dagger into my soul. I look back at the children who are now shepherding squirrels. I recall how I envied that their innocence persisted so stubbornly and yet so proximately to where mine had been shattered into many tender pieces. I glanced back at this person whose grin was just as derisive then as it is in their golden photo op. I returned the treat and walked away in sadness, dwelling on a newly discovered pain. And yet it does. I uttered under my breath. And just want to take a moment to note that the people who the Penn faculty met was Israeli president Isaac Herzog that personally signed the bombs that have been leveling neighborhoods in Gaza. And actually, I'm honored to know the author of this piece, Omar, and, uh, and he gave me his blessing to use this piece in this video. So thank you, Omar. Anyway, so I want to go back to the encampments at Penn. And I just want to commend them for their bravery because I know how hard it must be to speak up against Zionism in such a Zionist institution. On one hand, for the hold it has, but also because Penn is a place where you're tricked to believe that your entire self-worth is based on what prestigious and lucrative job you get after graduation. How that basically sums up your entire experience there. And I know it'd be so much easier to just ignore what's going on and focus on getting the best job you can get or not putting your career prospects at risk. I don't know, maybe it's hard to understand if you're not there, but at Penn it feels like your whole identity has been based on your career and academic achievements. It's your whole world, it's your whole existence, for a lot of people anyways. And it can really feel like you're challenging your own survival or everything you've ever worked for up to this point to go to a protest like this. But y'all still went out and did it. Honestly, applause to y'all. I truly don't know what I would have done in your shoes. Like I mentioned earlier, I was so afraid to go against the grain. I was so afraid to burn the white goodwill that I had built up over the years. And I'm certainly not the same person that I am today as I was back then. So I truly commend y'all for what y'all did. All of us pro-Palestinian alumni are so proud of what y'all have done. And I know I speak for all of us when I say thank you for making us proud at a time that it's been difficult to be proud of our academic institution. And of course, I'm sure all the Palestinians are grateful for it as well. <sighs> well anyways, y'all, if y'all wanna check out the first video that I made about this, it's right up here. Uh, thanks to everybody for watching. Don't forget to eat your legumes, take your B12 supplements, and I'll see you on the next one.